Hello everyone! I hope you're sitting comfortably, because today's video is gonna be a little bit different than what I usually create. Recently, I've noticed a few common ideas circulating the PVZ cyberspace. Lots of talk about game design, level design and the sort. And I'm glad that there's many mods out there curious about such discussions, as it only makes the experiences we make for each other better. However, there's a lot of misinformation going around which I want to clear up. Given that I've been the lead designer of an upcoming PvZ2 mod, I feel like I could give my two cents on the issues which have manifested over the past few seasons. I've worked in game design for many years up until now and have acquired plenty of experience on the topic, but still keep in mind that this is all coming from a subjective viewpoint. To my credit, I've got the game design of Ludum Dare Games Home and Ouroboros, many SMBX projects including my work in progress game SMBX True Time 2, and an award-winning stage within the SMBX community. If you disagree with me about any point in the video, that's fine, but these are the things I specifically find to be problematic with the way certain elements are perceived in the PvZ modding space. With that being said, I hope you enjoy the video. If you've been in the PvZ circles for even a little while, you must have heard something that goes along the lines of EA ruined PvZ2 because of microtransactions. Mods make it good. And the former is half true for PvZ2 in its current state. It is uh, quite disappointing to say the least. I say half true because EA is just a publisher and isn't in charge of design or anything else for that matter. PV2 came out and it's uh, a tablet mobile thing. They're like, well, look at what EA did. I'm like, I think the most misconception is that EA forced any of that on us. Like, that was most of those choices, if anything, were all internal choices that were chosen long before we ever got bought out. PopCap are the devs themselves regulating in-app purchases and other stuff. Uh, th that's just a common mistake I see people make, and I want to correct it. Uh, anyways, yeah, modern PvZ2 is filled with thousands of in-game currencies and waiting systems like any other trendy mobile game. But this isn't the way it was meant to be. This is not what it was. People often take the fact that the game contains microtransactions to mean that it has always been soulless, that it really didn't offer anything much but a shell experience that was banking off of the original plans for zombies. And at least that's the idea that was being pushed even since the game released back in 2013, even before it devolved into the mess it is today. This idea that EA ruined the game with microtransactions. Alright, let's examine that. But before we get in deep, I think a history lesson is due. If you weren't involved with PvZ2 from 2013 to 2016, here's the summary of how things went in terms of updates. PvZ2 launched with three worlds in 2013, and over the course of three years, it got updated regularly with new worlds to play. From three worlds, the game eventually went up to 10, until, by the end, the devs decided to end the adventure off with a finale, Modern Day, the culmination of its adventure. After the last Modern Day update came out, the adventure was unofficially over, and that's the point where I'd split the timeline. Among other reasons, it's because some of the original talent working on the game started to drift away at that point. And that's quite evident in the update which followed, the notorious leveling update. See, with the adventure being over, PopCap needed to put out something, I guess, and out of nowhere it decided to add the functionality of leveling up plants to the game. This was a horrible idea for several reasons. The game was never made with leveling in mind, so what ended up happening was a disaster. The balance got torn to shreds, as you can now use a single level 10 pea shooter to kill gargantuars, completely defeating the point of strategizing. Not to mention, the whole thing was just a ploy to get you to buy seed packets, which was a new gacha system never present before. This update was the point where it all started going downhill. All future updates were either nothing of note, or just further messed with the original experience by adding things that honestly just worsened it. I'd confidently say that we can look at current PopCap and PZ2, and old PopCap and PZ2 as essentially different entities. Both were going for different things, and both felt quite different to play or read about. Therefore, let's split the game into two eras. 
pre-leveling and post-leveling. Anything post-leveling will not be discussed in this video, as I think that there's little to discuss about, really. It's just bad. And the importance of pre-leveling PvC2 in the modding sphere is great, because most mods choose to adapt that version of the game, while the content from post-leveling PvC2 remains as miscellaneous goodies or merely little helping trinkets that people can use for their code, like vultures. But with all that out of the way, let's take a look at how PvC2 as it was originally published, had most things figured out. The original game was published as a free-to-play title, something not expected by most since the first game was pay-to-play, however I recognize the need there was for this. By making it free-to-play, you allow much more people to get interested in the experience you're offering, and you're reaching a much wider audience, including all the people who don't want to pay for apps. So the question is, how to make money in a way that allows free-to-play, but doesn't interfere with gameplay? Well, in my opinion, PvC2 knew to strike the right balance. Instead of locking important content behind paywalls, like worlds and levels, the only thing you had to pay for was a few selected premium plans, which you didn't even need to complete the game. That was practically it. Sure, the game tempted you with these plans, but that's because it's the only way they can make money, really. And unless the idea of not having everything unlocked physically pains you, it wasn't that big of a deal. I mean, considering you got a fully-fledged game with no compromises for free. Uh, plus, if you want to have everything unlocked, you could, you could just switch out the pp.dat, and you could, just, you, could, you could switch that out. And that's why I think that saying EA ruined PvC2 with microtransactions is fundamentally a broken statement and shows a blatant dismissal of what the team working on the game managed to achieve. Sure, you can say that about the newer versions, you know, despite EA still having nothing to do with it, but I don't see how dismissing the quality of the game by claiming that it was some money-grabbing scheme because of a tiny number of locked plants benefits anyone. Don't let these complaints sway into thinking that. But if you legitimately believe that the game would have worked better as a pay-to-play, that's also a perfectly fine opinion to have. I'm just pointing out that the overwhelming success and reach it had was in large part due to the fact that it was free to play. And if you have a problem with the concept of microtransactions themselves, well, well I don't think any mobile game would pass your criteria there. There's no need to just single out PvZ because the original game chose to adhere to pay to play instead, because it was the more viable system at the time of its release. It's been nearly 10 years since PvZ2 released. The modding scene of it really got started around 2016 with the big mods releasing like Time Distortion and later on Holiday Mashup, so it's had a lot of time to develop since then. At this time, things were more experimental and loose, and the structure was quite close to how PvZ2 usually rolled. If we view the most popular mods of today, the they all mostly follow the same structure. Take the progression system of PvZ1 and implement it into PvZ2 with some even disregarding theming for the sake of an experience closer to the threat escalation of PvZ1. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with such an approach, it's an alright way to structure your tower defense game, however, notice how I said, like, PvZ1 twice in a row. I think you can feel where I'm going with this. So many mods adopting such a structure could be a consequence of a domino effect, but what it unintentionally or intentionally did is painted the progression and structure of PvZ1 as superior and something that PvZ2 needs to be changed into for the sake of a good mod. And it doesn't stop at progression either. It seems that nowadays, anything close to the vanilla experience of PvZ2 is viewed down upon. This is possibly due to the amount of people being nostalgic towards the first game while simultaneously being told that the second one is a poor sequel due to... <coughs> Microtransactions. But I don't think leaving it at that would do it justice. Let's actually examine PZ2's design briefly to determine if there's anything concrete about its approach being lesser than PVZ ones. In order to better understand the intent of PZ2's design, I recommend watching a very informative video titled "The Art of Reanimating Plants vs Zombies 2." where the lead artist, Mark Barrett, elaborates on the various challenges the team faced when having to create a sequel. I'll leave the video in the description, but to summarize, the team couldn't just make PvZ more edition. 
It had to feel like a logical continuation of the concept. The way they chose to tackle this was through locations being themed after different time periods. This allowed them to springboard ideas for all kinds of new challenges, plants and zombies. The way PvZ2 is structured is by using a set amount of levels with varied objectives for each world, usually separated at the beginning or middle by a gargantuar battle level which allows you to progress to the next world or stay in the one you're currently in to complete it. At the end of each world there is a unique boss fight themed around that world's location. New threats keep popping up as you play through each world, but you constantly unlock new plans to combat them too. Overall, this structure isn't too different from the one of PvZ1. If anything, it feels like an evolution due to the similar elements but wider execution. Level design-wise, PvZ2 likes to challenge you by placing various objectives onto you that you need to fulfill by the level's end. Level design-wise, it's a lot faster paced than PvZ1, which leads to a lot of frantic moments. And for the most part, the level design isn't much of note on each individual level, but the levels all come together to form a cohesive experience for each world, so they play a slightly different function compared to the first game. The level design itself is either hit or miss. Sometimes it's quite fun, but other times it's just outright too spammy or demanding. And with all that being said, the amount of innovation on display is just too vast to be able to say that levels like that are a deal breaker. Many people aren't fond of conveyor levels and zomboss battles due to the RNG involved, and in some cases, it can really suck, I agree. But overall, I think the RNG is used in a tasteful way. Contrary to popular belief, having RNG elements in your game is not a sin by any stretch of the imagination. RNG serves its purpose, and if it causes you an unfair game over, that's more to do with the level designer not being cautious with it, rather than the RNG itself existing. Using small increments of RNG in controlled scenarios can make for very interesting experiences and adds a ton of replayability. Especially if the RNG in question is a random chance for something beneficial, and PZ2's design already does something similar. The swashbuckler zombies in Pirate Seas having a small chance to fall into the water is exactly uh -oh. this kind of RNG. Avoiding all RNG when making your game is an overkill in the same way that avoiding to walk outside your house would be because something bad could happen. Sorry for that little RNG tangent there. A anyways, uh, PZ2's design overall is a lot more action oriented and it's very dynamic and flexible. There's definitely flaws with it, but when comparing it to the first game, I honestly think that liking one over the other could be largely chucked up to preference. Both offer well-designed experiences that are widely different in their feel and dynamic. PvZ2's design may be a little more rough around the edges than the systems PvZ1 has, but that's honestly just because PvZ2 attempts to do a lot more than PvZ1. The amount of varied content itself is enough evidence of that. So truly, my conclusion here is that there isn't anything inherently better about either game's design. It's more to do with preference of how you like to play a PvZ game, with more simple and well-defined elements, at a more relaxed pace, or with a lot of moving parts in an action-y environment. Therefore, I encourage all mods to acknowledge PvZ2's strengths, and instead of trying to replace them with those of PvZ1, try to expand upon them. There's no need to act like the first game is the only well-designed one because of its nostalgic attributes. And if you like the gameplay style more, that's great! But downplaying the well-developed mechanics and structure PvZ2 has to offer will only lead to less experimentation and design elitism. And making good games requires both of those things to be in check. Over time, the concept of accessibility in games has become really muddled in terms of how it relates to PvZ. A great number of PvZ mods have focused on purely delivering a difficult experience with no need to treat players with safety nets or any type of equipment to adjust the difficulty amount. Due to so much exposure to this type of design, a stigma started to circulate. One of a philosophy that offers no aid and one in which players can easily get nowhere. It's important to realize that difficulty is merely a tool that we as designers need to fine-tune to make exciting gameplay. Disregarding how delicate it is to thread the line of difficulty in relation to accessibility is something which should not be underestimated. 
I'll be talking about how PVC2 handled safety nets to remedy this, and why I feel that having them in place is good practice in the sphere of PVC gameplay. What is accessibility in games? In short, it's how much the design of a game makes sure people from all skill levels get to enjoy the gameplay. Let's take the king of accessibility in terms of difficulty, Mario. All Mario games are designed on the simple principle that players of lower skill levels can pick up and play the game with little issue, but the veteran players can have fun too with the amount of optional challenges or restrictions. That's why Mario games are perfect for players to learn to speedrun. The way these games achieve this is with the philosophy of difficulty being adjusted so that the game mechanics are easy to learn, hard to master. You've probably heard that saying by this point, but for a good reason. It's an extremely effective way to approach difficulty as a concept. But what are some of the methods used to further this philosophy in the games themselves? Well, good examples would be power-ups Mario can collect to grow big or shoot projectiles. Besides offering variety to gameplay, they exist to ease new players in and provide safety nets for them to learn the ins and outs of the game. This has ensured that the games are fun for players of all skill levels without having a difficulty select. That's very thoughtful design. In SMB3, a feature was added where players were now able to store power-ups to use in particularly troublesome levels. This was done to counter the issue of players getting stuck on certain levels without being able to progress. We can all agree that it isn't fun to be stuck on one level for a long amount of time, essentially making no progress in the game. Because there's no way that game designers can know when something like that will happen to each player, they need to devise a system that can allow the player stuck to have a bit of a helping hand so that they can continue the adventure. PVC2 has this in terms of plant food, power-ups, and plant boosts. Plant food acts as a Mario power-up, and it can be acquired during levels and used on any plant to make it deal a powerful attack or boost its normal attributes. Actual power-ups, which are those three circles you can see at the bottom right corner, act as a safety net which you can use in a clutch at the cost of in-game currency. Plant food is used in order to clear particularly tough zombies or to prevent game overs in clutch situations. Power-ups are mostly used when players get very deep into a level but are about to lose, or are sick of replaying levels due to their difficulty. These safety nets are features which are meant to prevent frustration and the stagnation of the player's mood. In PvZ, Losing to one level over and over again can easily spiral into a frustrating and unpleasant experience. Unlike Mario, when you fail a level in PvZ, you don't get to have another go at it immediately in the same sense. The thing about PvZ's gameplay is that it takes great dedication from the player to engage with a level. You can't just restart from the last checkpoint after slipping up. When starting each attempt, players must carefully pick out their strategy, spend at least several minutes setting up the essential things, and then engage with the main challenge of the level. It's a lengthy process, and for that reason, accessibility is of great importance. To make a great experience for players of all skill levels, it's important to provide safety nets and alternatives like this. They provide lower skilled players the ability to have a good time and continue the adventure, while not affecting the experience of higher skilled players negatively. By allowing lower skill players access to the rest of the game's content, they get the opportunity to hone in their skills much better than if they had to replay the same thing over and over. Another good thing to allow for this is a non-linear way of progression, where different players can choose when they would like to tackle certain challenges, instead of being forced to solve everything in a predetermined order. That doesn't make this method of progression superior, but it does allow more customizability for each player to play the way that best suits them and them specifically, and is a method which should definitely be considered if some players are having a rough time. We can even go back to the original accessibility feature for PvZ, the lawnmowers. They function in much the same way, they provide a safety net to players who are struggling by preventing game overs. And for those who didn't need help of the lawnmowers, PvZ2 adds a system which rewards them with coins after the end of each level. Lastly, I feel the need to bring up plant boosts. I need to clarify that I didn't touch on plant boosts because I don't believe they make for a good example of this. The way PvZ2 chose to implement them is rather flawed and most players avoid using them for that reason. However, they're removed from regular gameplay by being connected to the Zen Garden and nothing else, so their presence isn't a deal breaker. But in my opinion, the game would have benefited from either reworking that system or not including it at all. All of this being said, I believe that power-ups like plant food, circle power-ups, and other things I've mentioned as well-executed systems of accessibility deserve their place in games such as PvZ. 
Many people find them to be off-putting due to them technically being able to break levels if players decide to invest a lot of money into them, but as long as such an endeavor is appropriately costly, it shouldn't matter too much. Besides, if a player decides that such action is absolutely necessary to get through a level, perhaps the fault is more with the level in question than the options provided for accessibility reasons. A lot of mods claim that removing the improvements to accessibility offered by PZ2 are bad for those reasons, and as I've explained, I don't really understand such a viewpoint. It honestly might just tie into the stigma that I've debunked in the previous paragraph, which states that PVZ2 is generally a badly designed game. Personal opinions being voiced here, I wonder if lawnmowers weren't a thing in PVZ1 and only appeared in PVZ2 if the same people would view them as negatively as they view booster power-ups. It's something to think about. I've left the most difficult topic to cover for last. Claims relating to the copying of someone else's ideas are serious accusations and talking about them lightly would do the topic a disservice. Either way, it's very apparent that how things stand in terms of PvZ modding, claims such as these are being thrown around far too freely and without understanding of their implications. To set the stage, I'd like to describe in detail what modders are limited with in terms of creativity and why similar concepts and ideas keep popping up from unrelated parties. This is an occurrence not only present in the PvZ modding scene, but also within animated movies dating as far back as the 40s. But for now, let's actually cover the ground rules. PvZ games are only editable in terms of data which is stored in something called the OVB. Many aspects of the games are hard-coded and quite literally uneditable by anyone that isn't a dev within PopCap. To make up for this lack of control, modders need to rely on their critical thinking to manipulate the existing data in unique ways to create something new. For example, you cannot create a new zombie without building it off of something already present within the OBB's code. Inserting new code with your own instructions is not possible. What you can do, however, is alter an ability of an existing zombie and give it a visual makeover. Sometimes you can combine various elements from zombies to create a brand new threat. But the through line here is that every modder is going to be working within these restrictions, and we're all working with the same foundation in order to make something new. Another thing important to take into account is the sheer amount of mods out there. There's only two or three really popular ones, sure, but you'd be surprised how many you'll find with a little exploration. There's at least 10 mods out there trying to pour Chinese content into international alone. Given the sheer amount of other people all working with the same toolkit, it suddenly doesn't seem so unreasonable that several mods have zombies with similar behavior. Even ignoring the coding limitations, these kinds of things happen often without it having to be direct copying of ideas. I'll credit YMS for his explanation of the following concept in his video covering the Kimba slash Lion King controversy. I've linked the video in the description and I highly recommend it, it's a good watch. At one part where YMS is trying to bring into question the validity of those plagiarism claims, he brings up the following point, which I also agree with as a musician. The vast majority of art follows very common formulas and tropes. The vast majority of popular songs are in 4-4 time signature, the vast majority of popular songs will utilize chord progressions that sound pleasant for the ear. You can't just play random chords and hope it sounds universally appealing. There is a logical equation to what makes sense and what doesn't. And this logic also applies to game design in the same way. You can't just throw a random new gimmick from one world into the other and expect it to work with what that world's theme and challenges are going for. When choosing new zombies as threats, or new plants to insert as counters to those threats, you're going to want to use specific established concepts within the game's world which complement your goals. If many people are trying to add new ideas to the same source, all independently of each other, general design practices dictate some general overlap. I could even bring up the example that YMS specifically brought up as well. The Rhapsody Rabbit and Cat Concerto incident. Back in the 1940s, Warner Bros. and Metro Golden Mayer Studios both released animated shorts that consist of another animated character playing the Hungarian Rhapsody No. 2 on the piano while there's a mouse inside it. Quite suspicious, wouldn't you say? Well, Rhapsody Rabbit had an earlier release date, while Cat Concerto had a more advanced production number. This essentially means that both of the shorts had to be in production simultaneously. So, how come the two are so similar? 
Well, if we take into consideration the fact that using classical music for animated features was a common practice used in that time period, and that if someone wanted to make an animated short about the character playing the piano, Hungary Rhapsody was one of the best songs used to achieve that. Or, in reverse, if they wanted to use Hungarian Rhapsody, someone playing it on the piano would have been a natural choice. And, using a small animal that would fit inside of the piano would add conflict that would appease the general formula of animated shorts at the time. Thus, it's entirely reasonable that both studios independently chose to have a mouse as that character, given how easy that animal lends itself to a cartoony design, and especially given the fact that in one of those franchises, the main character is a mouse. I've broken down this example to prove that, even when looked at on the surface, two similar ideas could have come from entirely different places at the same time due to the way that creativity and culture simply works. By no means do I intend to imply that the theft of ideas doesn't happen within these parameters, but I'm trying to prove that simply pointing at two mildly similar things and claiming plagiarism without any proper foundation is toxic and destructive and pointless. If people aren't allowed to have similar ideas within already restrictive environments, furthering the development of any mod ever would be impossible. I mean, a mod itself already has a f the main game as a foundation. There's also the important fact that similar ideas being executed differently is just an undeniably good thing. Lost City and Far Future both have beneficial tiles, but the way they chose to go about implementing them changes the entire feel of those two worlds. Thus, making a zombie capable of shooting projectiles will not function the same way in a world like Pirate Seas and Big Wave Beach, for example. There's a lot more important things to consider to a design element besides just the surface level similarities to something else. You can undeniably claim that one thing copied another if you reduce the two concepts enough. It doesn't even take a lot of skill to be able to do such a claim. If you strip down football mech and excavator zombies rolls down to zombie that can move plants around instead of eating them and therefore claim that they are really similar or that they are the same zombie, you are purposely ignoring the important elements and context which sets them apart. Even something as similar as a relic hunter compared to a swashbuckler plays a much different role in terms of design than you might think. One is simply used as a basic variety zombie for plankless lanes in pirate seas, while the other is designed to be a legitimate threat which puts the positioning of your plants into question. Claiming that one is the same as the other because they have reused animations misses the entire point of their individual roles as zombies. So, instead of trying to look for vague similarities in different concepts, try instead to approach them the other way. What sets them apart? In my opinion, that's a far better question to ask when you want to identify plagiarism of gameplay concepts. And once again, I must clarify that I'm not trying to justify plagiarism of anything, because I know some people are gonna take it that way. No, I'm not trying to justify plagiarism of artistic aspects such as visuals, animations, music, and so forth by using the same criteria. Theft of those should be pretty obvious and pointed out whenever noticed. However, claiming that somebody has stolen something more abstract, like a gameplay element, has more nuance to it than merely looking at the two side by side. You can't just point at the superficialities. If a true theft of ideas did occur, the original idea should stick out as feeling more appropriate for its own context than the stolen one does in its own. But even at that, there are always exceptions, right? I'm not trying to claim that these are like 100% foolproof techniques of being able to find what was truly stolen or not. No, my point here was to try and get people like yourself to think twice before pointing at something that looks kind of like another thing and then claiming that because of aspects which on closer inspection could have just not been related to each other at all are the same thing. You have to think about if these concepts can be reasonably assumed that they were conceived independently of each other. Because whenever a person does something like that, unjustly, they're just harming everyone in the process while also looking dumb if someone points out that what they're saying doesn't make that much sense. And while they're at it, they're also unintentionally, or 
I hope not intentionally, trying to put a limit on creativity by implying that similar concepts can't simultaneously exist in different environments. And that's just a very dumb point to make, because if you look at any type of art form, you will just see that people constantly upgrade on what came before, or are putting their own twists on it. That's how art forms and culture works. You take something, and then you put your own twist on it, and in the process, you are evolving the art form. If you're not allowed to make it even a little bit similar to something that may have already existed a hundred years ago, would you think that music or, you know, art or anything would have progressed at all? Sorry for that little ramble, but th things like that just really don't make sense if you actually think about it. Well, I'm gonna end it there because, you know, that was quite a trip. Perhaps it was kind of lengthy, but I think the journey was worth it because these topics are complicated to talk about. Anywho, I think I've demonstrated everything I needed to in order to put common stigmas into question. What's particularly infuriating to me is that, at one point in time, I also bought into these stigmas. For however flimsy they may be upon closer inspection when viewed through a game design lens, they do sound catchy, and you know that's what makes them spread. I mean, come on, saying that something is bad because of EA has become a catchphrase at this point. But you know, that's exactly why misinformation catches on. People take things for granted because they've heard it being said around, so they assume that it has some roots in validity. And once we hear such information, our brains tend to anchor onto it and notice possible things which can support it, while un unknowingly turning a blind eye to the points which go against it. All that is to say, do your own research, people. Always ask for sources and question that which you hear, because otherwise you might just turn a blind eye to something which could have offered you a great time or could have helped you develop the skills you're passionate about. Remember, people can always make things up, especially for game design. People really like to make things up in order to sound smart. Sorry for getting a little preachy at the end. Uh, I haven't done one of these in a very long while, and I'm thinking maybe I should do more. I don't know, you tell me. Uh, you know, it's really because I was working on Reflores that much uh, that has given me new perspective on PVC's design in general, and I, I hope I showcased some of that new fun perspective in this video. Uh, anyways, uh, about music? Well, yeah, music is coming, it's on its way, uh, as well as more updates on the mod. We've purposely kept a lot of things secret in order to not spoil things which could get great reactions out of players. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to take that away. I want players, when they see all the new stuff that we've added, to be really surprised. I really like seeing reactions like that, and I can't wait for that. Uh, so, all in all, lots of things to be excited about are on their way. And hopefully now, they will arrive in an environment more understanding of this franchise inner workings, instead of just quoting something that a Redditor said five years ago. Uh, the videos I've used as sources are in the description below. Thank you for watching, and peace out.